Good to go. Have a good session. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, hi everyone, and welcome to the session on lattice-based cryptography. So I'm Ron Steinfeld, and I'll be the co-session chair with Shibai. And um, so, um, yeah, for our first uh, paper, we have uh, the uh, title Practical Exact Proofs from Lattices, New Techniques to Exploit Fully Splitting Rings by Mohamed F. S. Gin, uh, Nok Khan Guyen, and Gregor Stiller. And Gregor will give the talk. Thank you, Gregor. Yeah. So does this work? Do you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Um, good morning, at least uh, to the people in Europe. Um, yeah, as uh, Ron has said, uh, this is uh, joint work with uh, Khan, Mian, Mohamed Eskin, and uh, myself. So I'm Gregor Seiler. Yeah, so our paper is um, essentially a part of a line of research where uh, the goal is to really construct uh, efficient or really practical lattice based zero knowledge proof systems. And um, in such a proof system, so the thing one wants to do is to be able to commit to some secret vector S and then prove uh, linear and product relations about the coefficients of S. And now in uh, this paper in particular, uh, and what we do is we show how to um, prove linear uh, equations using a particular lattice-based uh, commitment scheme, which is uh, the BDLOP commitment scheme. So for example, a simple equation like uh, the one on the, on the slide. Um, I should say that if uh, the goal is only to prove uh, linear uh, relations, then at least for certain types of, of uh, relations, uh, this can be uh, quite easy with the BDLOP commitment scheme. But the hard part is you want, if you also want to do um, product proofs. And so um, our linear proof basically works for a particular version of the BDLOP commitment scheme that allows for efficient product proofs. OK, so I won't go into uh, any details, obviously, just uh, this uh, very short slide. So um, how our uh, uh, linear proof works is uh, basically by proving a scalar product with a uh, uniform challenge factor. So and this is well known that uh, if one proves such a scalar product, then this shows the linear equation with soundness error 1 over q. And hence, um, the, the first main technique in our paper is a new way uh, to prove scalar products uh, with committed to vectors under the BDLOP commitment scheme. And then after this uh, is achieved, the problem that remains is that uh, since uh, the, the scalar product only gives soundness error 1 over q, and the q is usually pretty small in lattice-based cryptography, so for example, think about encryption schemes, they have usually like uh, 12, 13 bits uh, Q, or uh, maybe signature schemes that have in the order of 20 to 30 bits, um, proving such a single scalar product will not have negligible soundness error. And um, now the straightforward way would of course be to just repeat the proof several times to boost this uh, soundness to something negligible, uh, maybe in the order of 2 to the 128. But um, what we do instead, and this is uh, the second main technique in our paper is uh, that we give a way to, or we show how to amortize uh, the auxiliary costs uh, that come with uh, such a scalar product proof over a se several simultaneous such proofs. So essentially, we show how to prove several such equations with the cost of, of only one such equation, and then um, achieve uh, negligible sums. Yes, uh, so much for the technique. Yeah, maybe I should uh, say that. Uh, and this technique, uh, this uh, sound boosting technique, uses uh, um, uh, some trace map and ring automorphisms. So, if you're interested in this, then uh, please have a look at the paper. Um, now, for the results. Uh, so, the way we usually benchmark uh, new proof systems in lattice based cryptography is that we compute the proof size for a particular. Um, basically is a standard problem for this type of, of proof systems. Um, and in particular, this is the, the, the problem of proving uh, many LWE samples 
which means that one proves an equation like the one on this slide, where the secret vector consists of the vectors S and E, and uh, that have total dimension 2048, and then prove this equation modular prime, which is around 32-bit. Uh, and for this problem, our proof system achieves a proof size of 47 kilobytes. Um, and you also see from, from the table on this slide that uh, there has been tremendous uh, progress in uh, lattice based zero knowledge in the last uh, two or three years. And it's really exciting uh, times for lattice based zero knowledge. Um, we also have an implementation um, for uh, our proof system, and uh, this achieves. Uh, um, prove a runtime of only a couple of milliseconds and, and the verifier time of, of uh, in the order of several hundred microseconds. Um, yeah, so this concludes my talk. Thank you very much. And I hope uh, you watch uh, the full version. Thank you, Gregor. Um, any questions? Uh, so maybe uh, I'll come up with a very quick question. So what, uh, so what is the LWE problem you use there? Is it structured like a module or reality? Um, because I, I think it's given just implicitly over there, right? Yeah, so this is a very good question. Um, so in general, since our proof system really works with vectors over ZQ with a, uh, no polynomial structure whatsoever, this can be a really a, a general LWE equation. Mm -hmm. But of course, this then contains the, um, the, the, the case where this the matrix, for example, encodes polynomial products and it's in fact a, a ring LWE or modular LWE equation. But it works for the, for the, for the general case. And this is where the implementation is based on, right? So this, Pardon me? this is the uh, implementation. Um, so the implementation, I think in the implementation, um, it, it doesn't really matter, but um, I'm not 100% sure now, but I think in the implementation, I actually took a, took a, took a um, module equation. So, so maybe to give some a bit more, um, so usually the, the way also in lattice space cryptography is that we choose module LWE over pretty small rings like mm -hmm. dimension one, uh, 128 and mm -hmm. the, the equation I, I implemented because it was the easiest to do was also some module LWE equation over such small rings. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I have another question. So the, the proof sizes you have here are for a Q of 32 bit, is that correct? Yes, this is correct. Yeah. Um, and they are for the fully splitting uh, rings, right? Yeah. Um, so can can you also use your techniques for non fully splitting rings? Like say if it splits into the Greek K factors where Q to the K is uh, Q to the 128 or something like that, like K equals four or something. Um, yes, so uh, in principle, this is problem uh, is possible. Then, uh, in in the case uh, you mentioned, where um, or so so uh, or yeah, where the ring doesn't really split uh, much, then you also don't need to boost soundness um, because uh, the the Geller product will be over some some larger um, base field if you want. Mm -hmm. um, the the problem is that there's always a trade-off in size. So you you if if you do this, you you gain um, uh, proof size in one part of the protocol, but you lose in the other part because kind of your commitments get slightly less dense, and the commitments itself need more communication cost. So mm -hmm. yeah. So for this example, we chose the fully splitting case, but uh, we could also have done the, the non-fully splitting. So how, how would they say the proof length compare roughly in between these two cases? Uh, this is I, this is very hard to say in a general way. So 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 for example, we we have some follow up work of this where we um, prove much uh, smaller statements. So for example, like only uh, integer relations where you commit to some integer and and prove uh, like for example product relation. And there the statement is so small that the commitment size is not really important that we didn't choose. Um, uh, fully splitting rings, but um, yeah. So this is 
So in general, I would say the, the smaller the statement is that you want to prove, the better it is to not go in the fully splitting case. And at a certain point, if, if your equation is big, then um, you gain by using the fully splitting case. But it's difficult to say where exactly the, the uh, cutover point lies. And you need to really compute this in a, on a singular basis. Mm -hmm. OK, yeah, yeah, thank you. All right. Um... Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Hi, Ed, there is a question on the chat um, from Mehdi Tibuchi. How does the proof size scale with the error size? Yeah, so, um, yeah, this is also a very good question. So in general, in this kind of line of research, we um, construct Tracked proof uh, systems that are linear in the statement. So our proof size is kind of is also linear in the in the length of the secret vector, which means that it's really somehow these proof systems are really geared towards pretty small statements that appear in lattice script space cryptography. Like, for example, if you want to construct privacy preserving protocols like group signatures and so on. Um, yeah, so they they they're not a direct direct competitor to to PCP type systems, for example. Which is something. Uh, I hope this answers the question. Um, I, I think the question was about the scaling with the error size and not the. The number. errors. So, what, what is meant by the error size? Um, the, ah, the, ah, I see, I see, I see. Okay, so, um, okay, so. Yeah, so right, in, uh, on, in, in this particular case, we have uh, chosen the ternary case where um, you really exactly prove that uh, the, the error is, is in the set minus one, zero, one. Um, now, if you want to have larger um, errors, then it really depends how much larger it is. So if it's just a, a bit larger, then you can still do this exactly like this. Because um, what you essentially end up proving, in, so this is not part of this paper, because our paper is only concerned with the um, with the with the linear relation and not uh, the, the product relation that is needed to prove that the, the error is actually small. Um, but the product proof there, if you need to, if you prove a larger error, then uh, the the degree of the equations that that you prove uh, increases, and for each additional increase uh, degree, you need some additional commitment to to what we call a garbage um, term. So at some point, this um, becomes not feasible anymore, and then there's uh, essentially two two solutions. You can either expand your error in some uh, lower base, or there's now also other techniques. For example, we have uh, uh, some follow-up work where we show how to do um, uh, where we show the uh, yeah, it's a kind of um, yeah, approximate shortness proofs inside uh, such commitments. But yeah, so this is not part of this work. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, let's move on to the second talk of this session, which is on the classical hardness of module Alta B in the case of linear rank. And the speaker will be uh, Katerina Botkos. Okay, uh, please go ahead. Uh, I guess Gregor has to stop yeah, sharing Gregor, his screen. <laughs> Gregor, please stop sharing, yes. Okay, so I should be on. Okay, go ahead, Katerina. Okay, so thank you for the introduction. And uh, so, yeah, uh, I'm going to uh, present joint work with uh, Corentin Judy, Adeline Roulongois, and Wei Changwen. Um, so, as I only have uh, five minutes, I will go directly to the core of our paper. So, our main result can be summarized in the following statement We show a classical reduction from a worst case lattice problem to the module learning with errors problem with a small modulus and linear rank. So when I say classical, I mean that the reduction is not quantum. And the worst case lattice problem I'm talking about is the approximate gap shortest vector problem over module lattices. And um, the module learning with errors problem is parameterized by some underlying ring of degree n, and this will be our asymptotic parameter. So if I say small, I mean that the modulus can be polynomially small in the degree n, and the rank as well will be linear in the ring degree. So let's recap some necessary notions. Um, let k be a number field of degree n, 
and R its ring of integers. And let sigma be the canonical embedding from K to the Euclidean space R of dimension N. Then any module um, of rank D defines the module lattice via this canonical embedding in um, the Euclidean space of dimension Dn. And every ideal, which is a module of rank one, defines an ideal lattice. Um, and so the thing that I would like you to take home, even if you're not familiar with those notions, is that um, module lattices are somehow special lattices. So not every lattice in R to DND is a module lattice. And for any lattice, we can associate a minimum, which is um, the smallest norm of a non-zero vector in the lattice. And so we can define um, the problem which is given a approximation factor gamma and some module lattice lambda and some positive parameter delta. We have to distinguish whether uh, lambda is smaller than delta or um, the minimum is larger than gamma times delta. So this is the gap shortest vector problem over module lattices. And the second problem that we need is um, again, a number field K of degree N and R its ring of integers where RQ defines the quotient ring, mod Q. Then uh, we can define the learning reverse problem in the following. So we have a matrix A of uh, M rows and D columns, which is sampled uniformly at random. And we have a vector B, which is given as A times S plus E, where um, E is a vector of small norm. And our search variant of the problem asks us to find the secret S. And the decision uh, version asks us to distinguish A, B from some instance where B is sampled uniformly at random. So the first thing is that if the rank uh, equals one, this is what we call the ring learning with R's problem. And if the degree equals one, so R equals um, the integer Z, um, this um, corresponds to the learning with R's problem. However, if the, for general degree N, um, every entry in this matrix hides some structured matrix of dimension n times n over zq. Okay, so now we have the necessary notion. Um, let's look at the motivation of our paper. So, um, Longlois and Stille gave uh, in 2015 a quantum reduction from the approximate gap shortest vector problem over module lattices to the module learning of ours problem. This reduction was quantum. Uh, but allowed a uh, small modulus and any rank. So the small modulus was good. The quantum reduction was kind of unsatisfactory. So people thought of, is it possible to have a classical reduction? And um, until now it was folklore that you can adapt the packet paper to the module setting and that this will give you a classical reduction um, for any rank with the expense of having a large modulus, but only going down to the search variant, as um, there's no search decision reduction for large modules uh, in the module setting. And here's our um, motivation and where our work comes in. So we give a classical reduction and um, allow for small modules, and we go down to the decisional variant. So we take all the positive parts of the things before with the expense of having some uh, restriction on the rank. So we need some linear rank. Okay, and how do we achieve this? So um, in fact, what we do is we follow the high level idea of um, the LWE counterpart uh, from uh, uh, Prokersky, Longlois, Pike, Adrikov, and Stille. And it can be some, uh, yeah, Depart, uh, parted in three steps. So we have step one, which is um, a classical reduction from the gap shortest vector problem over module lattices to the decisional variant of module LWE. And um, we not only take the PyCAD paper, but we also take a more recent result from um, PyCAD director and Stephen David Davids to go directly down to the decisional version. And the second step is um, then a reduction from module LWE to a variant where the secret is chosen to be binary. So instead of having coefficients between zero and Q minus one, we have uh, coefficient zero one. And um, we therefore use um, a argument, a, a paper from, uh, yeah, for LWE and adapt it to the module setting and also use a more intelligent noise fluting. 
And here you can see um, where the restriction on the rank comes from. So in order to apply this, um, this argument, we need the leftover hash lemma. And this um, requires the rank to be larger than log q. But q is from step one um, large, so expon exponentially large. So um, this gives a linear rank. And then the last step is um, we have still to shrink the modulus, so from a large one to a small one, and therefore use a result from Albrecht and Deo. And the loss in this reduction depends on the norm of the secret. And this explains why we take a binary secret, so we minimize the loss. And yeah, so let me conclude. Uh, this was really short, so if you're more interested, I recommend the video or the ePrint version. And um, so ongoing work right now is that we try to improve the uh, hardness result on the binary variant and especially make it independent of the number of samples. And the big open question that remains is um, what happens for a regime where the rank is smaller than logarithmic and Q? So in particular, uh, what happens with um, rank equals one? So we have no insights about the hardness of binary ring uh, learning with errors or the classical hardness for small modulus. Okay, so um, thank you, and I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, uh, thank you for the for the presentation. Uh, I already see a question on the Zoom chat from David Karshama. Uh, the question is: Does the RS15 quantum reduction follow the Euro RW ring RW hardness without blueprint? Uh, I have to see it. Ah, mm -hmm. follow the usual. Yes. So, um, so the Longlois and Stille paper follows the is an adaptation of the uh, the Regev paper from two thousand five to the module setting. Okay. Uh, I just have a very quick question, uh, Katrina. Uh, uh, which particular step restrict that the run has to be? Uh, linear in the degree of the tension, right? So yeah, so it's in... so this this is what I said in step two. So mm -hmm. it's it's I know in this short uh, five minutes it's really difficult, mm -hmm. but in fact what we do is we take this um this lossy argument where you you replace uh, the uniform matrix A by some LWE sample. And mm -hmm. in order to hide some information you have to make the matrix Thinner, so you have to hide some smaller rank, and the ratio between what you hide and what you have it has to be uh, logarithmic in Q, mm -hmm. and as Q has to be exponential, you need linear rank. Thank you. Uh, I also see a question on the chat from Kevin Buckley. Uh, is there some intuitive reason why the small rank version should be different? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I guess it's just uh, it's just that our proof techniques right now don't adapt for it, don't don't work for smaller ranks. So it because of this leftover hash lemma. But for me, there's no intuitive reason why there should be um, a change in the log Q setting. So I guess it, I don't know how it is for this um, very extreme case where the rank equals one, but at least a bit smaller than log Q should be possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, that's all the questions I got. Uh, I will pass it to Ron for the next. Uh, there's one more question, but I think due to the time, let's move it to offline. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer it in the in the chat. Yes, please. Okay, Ron. Uh, I'll pass all right. It to thank you. you. Uh, she. So the next talk. Uh, is titled Lattice Based E Cache Revisited by Amit Deo, Benoit Libert, Juan Aguin, and Olivier Sanders. And Amit will give the talk. Thank you. Okay, hello. Um, so, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, so I'll be giving this talk on lattice-based eCache uh, just to overview um, overview uh, the literature on compact offline eCache. Essentially, there are many schemes uh, proposed. 
Unfortunately, last year at AsiaCrypt, Bourse et al. showed that there's a flaw in the security proofs underlying all of these uh, schemes. And they proposed a new construction that has uh, can be instantiated under, under number theoretic assumptions. So unfortunately, uh, this leaves open the question of provably secure lattice-based eCash. So this is what we investigated in this paper. Okay, so uh, just to give you a flavor of what eCash is. Um, so the idea is that we want to somehow reproduce uh, the privacy and utility of traditional cash payments in a digital world. Uh, so to begin with, a user uh, can go to a bank and engage in a withdrawal protocol to obtain a wallet W. And for compact eCash, this wallet W, the size of the wallet should be independent of the number of coins. Um, Next, the user can go to a merchant and engage in a spend protocol. At the end of this protocol, the merchant obtains a coin that it can later on deposit at the bank. Um, so for eCash, we want to somehow reproduce the, some of the useful properties that we have for traditional cash payments. For example, the anonymity of spenders. Um, so in eCash, when a user engages in many spend protocols, it ought to be able to remain anonymous. Another extremely useful property in the case of traditional cash payments is the ability of merchants to accept payments offline. In particular, when accepting a traditional cash payment, a merchant doesn't have to connect to the bank or a um, central server in order to accept a, a cash payment. All it has to do is inspect the bank note. However, in the digital setting, this kind of uh, causes an issue because there's nothing to stop a user from spending the same coin at two different merchants because the merchants uh, can't connect to some central server and check whether the coin it's receiving has already been spent. Um, so in order to overcome this issue, eCash schemes introduce this, um, or offline eCash schemes, introduce this identification mechanism, whereby any user that double spends uh, can be de-anonymized by the bank and then potentially punished. Um, However, this identification mechanism introduces uh, new possibilities for malicious behavior from the bank. In particular, a bank may want to falsely accuse a user of double spending. Uh, so all eCash, all offline eCash systems must uh, provide a uh, property called exculpability, preventing this uh, false, these false accusations. So Bors et al in the AsiaCrypt 19 paper they showed that the, some or most of the previous offline schemes have um, a flaw in their security proof, in particular in the, their proofs of exculpability. So without going into any details almost at all, uh, the crux of the problem was that these proofs, they, they wrongly assumed that two coins sharing the same serial number implies that uh, a single user is behind the two coins or in other words, that a single public key underlies the two coins. Um, so Bors et al, they, they came, proposed a new solution. Unfortunately, they used building blocks that aren't known to be instantiable under lattice assumptions, uh, which led us to this work. And essentially what we did is we came up with a new construction that lies outside the Bors et al framework. So uh, I'm not going to go into any details at all. All I'll give you is an intuition onto what our serial numbers look like to overcome the uh, aforementioned issue in proof of exculpability. So our new serial numbers will use a single PRF evaluation Y, and the serial numbers have two parts. The first is a lossy trapdoor function, um, F applied to Y. The second is the public key additively blinded by a universal hash applied to Y. Uh, so all I'll do now is make two observations and say why this is a good design. Uh, so the first observation is that if the lossy trapdoor function f is injective and two serial numbers collide, they necessarily share the same value y, which means they necessarily share the same uh, value uh, of public key. So this immediately overcomes the uh, issue in the previous proofs of x culpability. Uh, the second observation comes into the proof of anonymity and it essentially says that serial numbers look independent of public keys. And in order to come to this conclusion, we use the leftover hash lemma <coughs> to say that if F is lossy, 
then the public key is being blinded by a uniform looking value. So of course, this is a small snapshot of the wider scheme. So if you want to know, see more of the details, I would point you in the direction of our paper. Okay, so um, just to simply conclude this very short uh, talk, um, we built a provably secure uh, lattice-based eCash and our construction um, fundamentally differs from the framework of Bors et al. And the solution uses a, a brand new coin structure that utilizes lossy trapdoor functions and also the leftover hash lemma in the security proofs. And additionally, we show that our entire construction is compatible with known lattice-based zero-knowledge proofs. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna say uh, for the short talk. So thanks for listening. Thank you, Amit. Any questions? Uh, yes, question from Katarina Butus. Um, does your construction allow for different bank entities so that as in the standard cash situation, the merchant can choose their bank on their own, maybe a different one mm -hmm. than the wallet's bank? Uh, our construction itself uh, uses a single central bank um, as is usually the case in eCash, but um, I'm, not, I'm not sure um, how we could adapt our scheme. I hadn't really thought about adapting our scheme to uh, support different banks, but it may be possible. I'm not, I'm not sure. But our scheme doesn't do that. No. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Um, can I ask also about, um, did you look at the concrete sizes for the coins in your scheme or? Uh, we, we didn't uh, precisely analyze the concrete sizes, but our scheme essentially um, is very similar or we expect it to be very similar in efficiency to the previous lattice-based schemes. So to give you an idea, uh, these schemes are still quite uh, concretely inefficient. Uh, so wallet, um, or at least withdrawal protocol, the communication required in the withdrawal protocol is usually um, between 50 and 100 megabytes, roughly. And the spend protocol is on the order of a couple hundred megabytes. So it's still inefficient. So um, yeah, uh, further research is required to, to see if we can make these schemes much more efficient. Mm -hmm. do, do you think that uh, your techniques can be improved further to reduce this? Or do you think there's some new ideas needed? I think that we would probably require some new ideas. Um, yeah, I can't really see um, us uh, using this scheme or making small adaptations of this scheme to, to suddenly get a very efficient scheme. Mm -hmm. OK, yeah, thank you. All right, so I'll pass it over to Xi, I think, for the next talk. Okay, thanks, Ron. Uh, our next talk is Twisted PHS, uh, using the product formula to solve approximated uh, SVP ideal lattices. And the authors are Olivia Bernard and Adeline Nagolos. Uh, I believe the speaker is Olivia. Go ahead, please. Okay, um, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, can you see my slides? Yes, as well. Okay. So I will start. Um, this is a joint work with um, Adeline Roulanglois, and this is about solving uh, approximate uh, shortest vector problem in ideal lattices. So um, <clears throat> an interesting feature of uh, crypto system uh, lattice based crypto systems is that you have um, worst case to average case reductions. And in particular, if you look at the ring LWE problem, the underlying cryptographic uh, um, problem, uh, you can show that it is uh, at least as hard as um, the shortest vector problem in ideal lattices. And therefore, this is a natural question to ask uh, whether um, ideal SVP is still as hard as, as um, SVP, uh, despite the algebraic additional algebraic structure. and. Okay, so the first uh, structure crypt analysis uh, came from um, a constatation in algorithmic number theory when people proved that um, there exists a quantum polynomial time algorithms to compute cash groups or S units. 
Whereas in the classical case, it should take exponential time two to the square root of n in cyclotomic fields, for example. And this gave rise to a very long line of uh, works, um, <clears throat> starting from a technical note claiming that uh, finding a short generator was easy in cyclotomic fields. And this was proven two years later and uh, generalized in all sorts of ways. And our work is mostly based uh, on, the, on the work by Pele, Marie, Enro, and Stelle in 2019, uh, which I will call PHS from now on, um, where they extend uh, this uh, cryptanalysis uh, to all fields, but you need a precomputation to the end, meaning that um, if you are ready to pay this uh, exponential precomputation, uh, you can see on the graph on the right here um, that um, with the quantum computer in polynomial time, you can solve approximate ideal SVP for uh, an approximation factor of two to the square root of n. So what did we in our work? <clears throat> uh, we formalized um, the use of the log s unit lattice and we proposed a new description using the product formula. So for those who don't know what is this, um, I, I put the product formula here. Um, this is saying that uh, the product of all absolute value of uh, your number field uh, is one. So you have infinite absolute value here and uh, PA dic absolute value here. And uh, this is really a natural generalization of the same formula in the rational number. I think for example, that uh, a number is uh, the product of all its uh, PA dic valuations uh, for all its divisors. And um, this is saying that 12 is uh, one fourth times uh, one, one third. And if you restrict this product to a small factor base, P1, PK, so you restrict here, you consider only the, the, the first K, uh, for example, the first K uh, element. And um, this is exactly saying, uh, if the product formula still holds, this is exactly saying that is uh, URS units, this is the definition. And you can look, uh, you can apply the logarithm function to each of the components. So you obtain this vector here, and you can see that there is a log norm P appearing here. And this is really the core difference with the PHS algorithm uh, I mentioned before. And these weights have uh, many uh, algorithmic uh, consequences that are very interesting. So we expect to have uh, to obtain a better s units combination. Um, and there is also the possibility that we can uh, maximize the density of the log s unit uh, lattice by uh, choosing carefully our factor base and so on. Um, unfortunately, we didn't prove theoretically that we, we perform better, but we did prove the same bounds and the same complexity as in PHS. So we really have the same uh, functionality uh, for our algorithm. But mostly the most important uh, thing is that experimentally we observed uh, that we obtain what seem uh, very orthogonal lattices. And at the end, we obtain very tiny approximation factors. So let me uh, finish uh, by uh, two experiments. Um, the first one is showing that the lattice is orthogonal. So on the left, you can see the twisted PHS with the weights. And on the, on the right, you can see the original PHS without the weights. And this is really between these two graphs, you have the same algebraic materials, the same S units, the same factor base, same dimension, same everything. And the only difference is the weights on the left and not weights, no weights on the right. And you can see two things here. So first, the curve on the twisted case is very flat. So this is really indicating that your projections don't modify too much. Um, yeah, somehow, somehow you are already orthogonal because otherwise you will have a decrease in the norms. And the second thing to notice is the, the difference between the dotted curve, which is uh, before um, the reduction, um, some reduction, and um, the plane curve, which is uh, after a big AZ reduction. And you can see that the two curves are almost superposed, and this is really not the case in the original PHS one. And um, this, if we could confirm this, this, this would lead to a quantum polynomial algorithm because um, the most uh, costly part, uh, I mean, the costly part of the computation in the quantum case is really uh, computing a CDP oracle for our for the lattice for the log s unit lattice and um, it should be easier if you are if you have already something which is a, which is a good with good shape shape um, okay and the last experiment is um, we implemented the algorithm from n to n from the ideal class group uh, discrete logarithm um, for for the challenge um, until uh, we obtain a, a shortest element candidate and the orange curve is the twisted uh, is for the twisted lattice 
Um, we obtain a proximation factor uh, 1.8 here, and uh, the blue curve is the original PHS, where the approximation factor here would be uh, 10 to the 11. So there is a huge gap between each curve because um, this is a logarithmic scale. And um, okay, thank you for your attention and don't hesitate if you have any questions. Okay, thank you, Olivia, for the talk. Uh, are there any questions? So maybe uh, I have a quick, uh, let me see, I have a question from David Sharma on the chat. Does your work need pre-computation on the member field? Yes, we need to pre-compute the logest unit lattice. Maybe in addition to this question, is the computation similar to the uh, PHS? Has this step have been changed or is it the same? So um, on the algebraic side, yes, we need the same uh, pre-computation as the um, PHS algorithm. But um, in practice, we don't need to compute uh, the CVP oracle. Okay. It seems that we don't need it. I mean, this is not a theoretical statement. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there any other questions? So do you have any, uh, going back to the experiments, the first experiment page that you showed us, uh, and the twisted PHS uh, gives a very kind of orthogonal or flat Gramsci meet graph. And do you know why? Do you have any idea of uh, why that's true in experiments? Yes, for the picture A. Why, why what? Why Sorry. is the Gramsci meet is, is, is more orthogonal or is more flat? Do you have any idea? No, I don't have any idea why, why, uh, why, he, why it is happening. Um, okay. okay. <clears throat> I mean, this could be a number of theoretic things. This could be, um, I mean, an intuitive, intuitive guess would be that uh, this is um, somehow expressing the um, cyclotomic uh, Stiegelberger lattice somehow because it's included in that. But uh, it's also true for, metro, for n true prime thing, fields. So I don't know. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Okay, so. Uh, I didn't see any questions, so uh, I think uh, let's move to the next talk. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, could you please unshare this so we can proceed? Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Ron, uh, I'll pass it to you. Yep, thank you, Shin. So uh, the last talk for this session is titled Simpler Statistically Sender Private Oblivious Transfer from Ideals of Cyclotomic Integers by Daniela Micianchio and Jessica Durell. And Jessica will present the talk. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. So can you hear me and see my screen okay? Yes, yes. Everyone? Great, okay. Um, right, so I'll be talking about joint work with my advisor, Daniele, on the lattice-based oblivious transfer. Um, oblivious transfer is a protocol carried out between two parties, a sender and a receiver. Um, the sender is given as input two messages, we'll say M0 and M1, and the receiver takes as input uh, a bit beta. And the protocol will allow the receiver to obtain from the sender the message corresponding to the receiver's bit uh, without needing to reveal its bit to the sender and without learning anything about the, uh, the sender's other message. Uh, so uh, an oblivious transfer protocol should satisfy basic correctness property, uh, but we'll really be interested more in the security properties in this talk. Um, specifically for the sender, uh, we'll be interested in achieving statistical privacy. Um, this means that no matter what the receiver does in this protocol, uh, the output of the sender is statistically close to a distribution that is independent of one of the messages. And we'll also want to ensure computational privacy for the receiver. Um, this will ensure that the receiver's bit is going to be computationally hidden. Uh, so there are a number of these protocols in the literature um, due to time constraints. I'll move through these very quickly, uh, except to sort of call out uh, the, the protocol of Berkersky and Daltling uh, here, which is very much a starting point for, for our work, if you're familiar with that. Um, so yeah, in terms of lattice-based oblivious transfer, we still have some work to do to bring these protocols into the realm of practicality. Uh, and in this work, we make some progress in that direction by reducing the total amount of uh, communication required by both parties, uh, bringing it down by a factor of about n log n, 
uh, while also reducing the, the total computation required to execute the protocol. Uh, before we get into the construction or the, uh, the protocol itself, I'm just going to breeze through some, some lattice definitions you're probably all familiar with, right? It's the additive subgroup of Rm generated by all integer uh, linear combination of spaces vectors. Uh, importantly, uh, we'll be interested in sort of like a relationship between a lattice and its dual. Um, so particularly, we'll be interested in the geometric relationship here. So um, I'll, I'll throw up these uh, nice little pictures from Odo Drago's course notes. Uh, and we can see that um, here the primal lattice is sort of dense in one dimension, uh, but sparse in another. And the dual lattice has sort of reciprocal geometry, right? So it's, it's dense in the directions in which the primal is sparse and vice versa. Uh, so um, to guarantee statistical privacy for the center, uh, we're going to need to be able to encode one message in such a way that it can be recovered and the other should be statistically hidden um, by some sort of lossy encoding. So um, given what we just talked about, here's how we'll, we'll do that. Um, and this is again sort of following the template uh, laid out in the Prokarski and Dotling uh, protocol. So given a, a basis for our lattice, uh, you could interpret our message as, as uh, or a message as being a vector and use it to select a lattice point, um, perturb this, this uh, lattice point with a you know, because of discrete Gaussian noise, a parameter sigma, and return this uh, perturbed vector as the encoding. Uh, the idea here is that a, a sparse lattice uh, with respect to the Gaussian parameter will allow for efficient decoding, uh, but for dense lattices, even maximum likelihood decoding won't work with like any useful probability. Uh, so the receiver can send a basis for a dense or sparse lattice, depending on its bit, and then one of the sender's two messages is encoded with respect to the primal and the other with respect to the dual. Um, so the question is, what do we do about a cheating receiver, right? So let's go back to this example we were looking at before. Um, we're, we're sparse in like one direction, but, but dense in other directions. So um, it doesn't seem like we can necessarily rely um, on our, you know, lossy encoding here uh, to, to hide the um, sort of like all dimensions of the message. Um, and our, our way of um, coping with this is sort of where we depart from the, the prokarsky dotling protocol. So, uh, we turn to algebraically structured lattices. Um, specifically, we restrict ourselves to structured lattices uh, for which the lengths of its n shortest linearly independent vectors are, are all the same, uh, where n is not necessarily like the, the full rank of the, the lattice. But, um, anyway, this means that there will be either no short vectors in our lattice, uh, or there will be at least n of them. Uh, so to show statistical center privacy for this protocol, we need to prove that right either uh, M0 or M1 will be statistically hidden. And to show this, we consider two cases. Um, in case one, our lattice has no short vectors. Um, so it's the case that the dual must be dense in all directions from the sort of reciprocal geometry. Uh, and our original encoding strategy works, right? Because we're dense in all directions. Um, uh, so, right, so we can know that the encoding with respect to the dual will we'll hide uh, our message, we'll say M0. And sort of more technically, uh, this this follows uh, the lossiness of our encoding follows from like a, a regularity lemma that was uh, proved in the the Ring LWE toolkit paper. Uh, in case two, if lambda has any short vectors, right? We we know that it has n of them, um, but again, this is not quite full rank. Uh, so so what do we do? How do we show statistical lossiness? Um, and here we can show that encoding a vector uh, implies, encoding a vector x, I guess, implies x has high min entropy in the presence of its encoding. Uh, so we can use sort of like a randomness extractor to yield a, a uniformly random mask. Uh, and then this uniformly random mask will hide the message m1 um, in the case where uh, our lattice has at least one short vector. Um, and the, the proof technique here is sort of similar to the, the one shown in Brokarski and Dotling, uh, which considers the Gaussian mass on the Voronoi cell of the lattice, right? Um, because the error vector that we're using to perturb our, our lattice point is drawn from a, a Gaussian, the most likely vector x in the presence of the encoding y is the one that minimizes this Gaussian noise, um, which means that the noise uh, essentially should be in the Voronoi cell of the lattice, uh, but since lambda is dense in some subspace, this happens with very low probability. Uh, and so x will have high conditional min entropy and we can we can use our extractor. Um, and so this is how we're going to be able to show statistical center privacy using the uh, sort of lossiness of these structured lattices. Um, so uh, in summary, 
we give a, a new lattice-based statistically centered private oblivious transfer protocol from structured lattices, uh, where our improvements in efficiency, both in computation and communication, uh, come from geometry of structured lattices and not just the compact representation, right? There's sort of this standard uh, improvement and efficiency that we expect when we move to these uh, algebraic with structured lattices, but this is sort of, uh, we get, I guess, an additional login factor over what you'd anticipate. Uh, and so we're able to achieve sort of log lambda or lambda is a security parameter uh, communication overhead, but we're, you know, ideally we'd have constant overhead. So we sort of leave as an open question if, if this should be possible. Um, and that's all I, I have to say. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Jessica. Any, any questions? Uh, yes, there's a question. Um, is there any hope to generalize your work to other cyclotomic number fields? Um, oh. Or one short vector does not give n minus one other vectors for free. Okay, so thanks. That's actually a, a great question. So um, yeah, in our work, we we present it using the sort of like coefficient embedding, right? Uh, which uh, uh, where the the property we're talking about, right? The lambda one equals lambda n uh, will will hold uh, for these power of two cyclotomics. Um, however, you can actually just immediately transfer. Like you can imagine uh, applying the canonical embedding um, to, to elements of, of the ring to, to take them into, or to sort of map them as into a lattice. Um, and then this actually immediately holds for, for other cyclotomics that aren't power of two, um, because this property will hold under the canonical embedding, just not the coefficient embedding. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, thank you. Um, any other questions? Um, so, so I have also another question. So the, um, we've got this improvement um, using structured lattices compared to unstructured ones. Um, do you think this improvement that you got is optimal or is there, could there be another class of structured lattices where you can get even more improvements? Oh, that's, that's a great question. Um, I, um, it's sort of, it's, it's a little bit hard for me to imagine. Okay, so um, I guess so the, so I'm sort of thinking of the, there's the, the power of two cyclotomics are kind of like the most structured thing that you'd hope for, right? Um, but I guess we're actually, you know, because we're not working in ideal lattices, we're working with these module lattices. Um, maybe it's possible that you could, um, you could impose some sort of additional, additional structure. Uh, but I, I couldn't imagine what that would look like or what that class of lattices would be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that would be interesting. All right, uh, thank you. So is there any other questions? It uh, doesn't look like it. So yeah, if not, then um, let's thank uh, all the speakers for this session.